from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. I got $500 here for you. And all I have to do is guess the mystery voice? Uh, is it Julius Caesar? This is Western Union, and there's a message with it. Building irregularity suspected, Manhattan, Nebraska. Proceed there immediately. Stay Cheyenne Hotel will advise. Regards, Paul McGraw, Chief Investigator, Great Chesapeake Fidelity and Insurance Guarantee. Okay, thanks. Sounds like you're in for some real fun, Mr. Dollar. I am? During the war, I was stationed near Manhattan, Nebraska. Good town? Good town. It made a Texas Army camp look like the promised land. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Mr. Paul McGraw, Chief Investigator, Great Chesapeake Fidelity and Insurance Guarantee, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures incurred during investigation conducted on behalf of your company, or the story of the big red schoolhouse. <laughs> Expense account. Item, transportation, $134, plane fare, New York to Omaha. Item, transportation, $3.95, bus fare, Omaha to Manhattan, Nebraska, which a fellow passenger told me was a quiet, sleepy little town. <laughs> but which seemed to be celebrating Rip Van Winkle Day as I stepped off the bus. Nobody was walking and everybody was running. I followed the crowd in the general direction of the excitement. Two blocks north of the main street, the fire crews were hard at work playing the hoses on what was very shortly not going to be the new high school building. And that's where a little man with black curly hair introduced himself. I am Paco Gonzalez. I carry those bricks myself. Watch fine new school grow up under my own hand. What's the matter? How come these buildings I worked so hard on for 16 months goes down in 16 minutes, huh? I ask you, mister, how come these... Oh, now, calm Get down. What are you talking about? Back. Back. Like everyone else in Manhattan, Nebraska, I spent the next three hours working with the emergency fire and disaster squads. And by 8 o'clock that night, we seemed to have it under control. I finally dragged myself over to the Cheyenne Hotel. But before I could leave the front desk, I had a long-distance call from you, McGraw. Johnny, where have you been? I've been trying to There's get There's been you... a big fire here in town. Everybody had to work on it. Uh, did Joe Stankovich get in touch with you yet? Who's Joe Stankovich? A guy who lives there. He tipped us, said something about a building we're covering being in bad shape. What building's that? A uh, new high school. Just put up six months ago. And it fell down tonight. What? In a heap. The building will retail now at a junkyard for about 35 bucks. Well... You better start with this Joe Stankovich and see what it's all about, Johnny. Right. Mac, I'll keep in touch. So long. So long. Room clerk, have you got city directory around here? Yeah, city directory in this burg? Yeah. Yeah, who do you want to find, Mr. Dollar? I know everybody in and out. Man named Stankovich, Joe Stankovich. Yeah, oh, him. City morgue. What? When? He just came over the radio. They picked up what was left of him out of the fire. Yeah, and that ain't much. <laughs> Joe Stankovich had no survivors and no close friends. He lived in the basement of the school and kept to himself. That was all I found out about him after asking questions around town for an hour or so. About 11 o'clock, I started back to the hotel. Turning a corner by an alley, two men in dark clothes were holding a third man in a tweed suit. The fourth man was giving him everything. Hey! Hey! When I came up, the three men scattered like burglars. The man they were beating pitched forward, and I caught him before he fell. You need some help, mister. Everybody needs help. But let me tell you who I am before you help me. Maybe you won't want to. All right, who are you? Bill Garrett. Yeah? Uh, you don't live here, do you? No, I just got in town this morning. I was the architect on that school. Well, don't you understand, Samaritan? Don't you see? Those three men were a group of citizens. Their kids could have been in that school when it caught fire and collapsed. And I'm afraid they feel that I don't design especially strong buildings. His office address was in his billfold. I held a cab and took him over there after stopping by a drugstore for bandages, iodine, and something to take off the chill. While I was patching him up, I remembered how he'd stood there without a sound while they did that to him. 
When he came around, I told him who I was and what I was doing there. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, you represent a powerful company, Mr. Dollar. But you're wasting time. You'll learn nothing from anyone in this town. I kind of thought you might tell me something, Garrett. Yeah, of course. I could tell you every delicious scandal that's happened here for the past 30 years. Every exquisite depravity and violation of the sanctity of human intelligence. Oh, no, I mean about the school building. Well, I can tell you there wasn't any reason for those boilers to be fired today. That there wasn't any reason for them to blow up. But they did. Any idea why? Lots of ideas. And all of them bad, Dollar. Real bad. Okay, tell me. Look, I was raised here. I went to college over in Lincoln. And one day I came back an architect. I was going to make the whole place over. Nice buildings, nice streets, everything. And you saw what happened. The school was my first big project. Yeah? I drew it four years ago, revised it a year later. And the city hired you? Better than that. I was so good, the day they broke ground on that school, I left for Paris to study at the Sorbonne. Then you weren't in town while it was being constructed. Mm. I was out learning how to build even better things. <laughs> I got back in town four days ago. I went over to see my building. Well, here's a laugh for you. They used my outside drawing, that's all. Looked like they made up the rest of it as they went along. I went over to see the building contractor to ask him about it. Double talk. He told me to keep my mouth shut if I ever expected to do any more work for the city. This building contractor, what's his name? He has a perfect name, Dollar. A fine, sunburned man with lots of good teeth and not an ounce of fat on his broad frame. Big Jim Madden. Where can I find him? <laughs> Twenty or thirty irate citizens of Manhattan had already gathered outside Jim Madden's home. But the ten uniformed men from the local sheriff's office forming a half-moon circle across the close-clipped lawns, as well as the two standing guard over the yellow convertible in the driveway, meant there'd be no kind of beating up around there. My identification card got me inside, where I waited around in a den that was stocked with good liquor and good leather chairs. Finally, a big man in a blue suit walked in. Dollar? Uh-huh. That's Jim Madden. You're the insurance man. What can I do for you? Tell me everything you can about that high school building. The city made a claim yet? I don't know. Uh-huh. You just happened to be in town. We heard something might be wrong with that building. Apparently, there was. Now, who told you a thing like that? Two boilers explode and there's something wrong with the building? Is that the way you people figure? We check into things. Well, so do we, and we couldn't find anything wrong. Who's your we? Me and the boys. Officially with the city construction department. We just had a big meeting. Yeah? I figured those people hanging around outside ought to be worrying you. Well, they don't worry me, and you don't worry me. Drunken janitor goes to sleep last night without turning down the boilers. The pressure kicks way up, the joint blows apart and burns down. Is that what you decided in that meeting? That's about it. It was a terrible accident, and we'll have to use an old garage or something for a school. But then we'll get around to building another with the insurance money we have coming. Good walls don't tumble out from that kind of explosion. We have to have some kind of specifications easy, on that. Easy, Dollar, easy. Of course you do, of course you do. Anything at all? Yeah, there you are. All the building specifications on the high school, okay? That'll do for now. Good. Now you can get out of my house. You smell smoky. There were 50 pages of specifications on that building materials used in the construction of the school. They looked all right. They also looked as if they could have been forgeries. I tried to get hold of Bill Garrett, but he didn't answer his phone. Then I noticed an inspection receipt at the back of the folder. It was signed by the local building inspector, a man named Mike DeGuerra. You stay up late, whoever you are, but come on in anyway. The woman standing in the doorway was tall and blonde and smoking a longer than you can buy cigarette that went with the black, filmy thing she was wearing. You say your name's Johnny Dollar and you want to talk to Mike, huh? I'm Vivian DeGuerra and Mike isn't home just now, but you can wait for him and talk to me. I'm not bad company. Oh, did a drink help? Help what? What if it's wrong with you? You look tired. It might, but I'd rather not. I just came by to talk to your husband. You said that. What do you want to talk to him about? Business. At one in the morning? Look, you probably missed your dinner tonight, and you've been getting all your nourishment out of a bottle. And you're kind of afraid Mike will walk in? No, Mike DeGuerra won't walk in. He's already walked out. And you're feeling kind of sorry for yourself. Why, I didn't... A man, if he lives in a place, is an ashtray or a picture or yesterday's sports section lying around the front room. There's nothing like that in this room. And 
If I walked over to that closet 10 to 1, I wouldn't find any of his clothes. Come on, tell me. When did he lamb out of town? Stop, you're hurting my arm. Come on, when? Three months ago. Get out of here. Why? Where is he? Find him and ask him. You're the detective. Johnny Dollar. It's a mess here. Your man Stankovich is dead. Was killed in the fire. Oh, that's a shame. What do you think? Well, political wraparound. The school was a fix on something or other. Dough somewhere. The town sewed up tight. All kinds mixed up in it. Somewhere. Yeah, that kind of thing, huh? Well, stay where you are, Johnny. I'm sending eight men. If they want to play that way, we'll play that way. Get to the bottom of this. Three seconds after I hung up the phone, I found out how much of a mess it really was. That's when my hotel door opened and a man lurched across the room toward me. Dollar. He stood in front of me, swaying back and forth, his hands clutching his coat. He fell before I could get to him. Three bullet holes formed a neat trio across where his tie pin should have been. I ran my fingers through his coat, pulled out his wallet. The driver's license read, Mike Daguerre, age 39, occupation, building inspector. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, the king of the cowboys, Gene Autry, will be riding the CBS range again this Saturday night. And Gene will be singing two of your favorites, Funny Little Bunny and Home on the Range. This Saturday, CBS also will take you on another trip with Vaughn Monroe's Caravan. You can hear them both every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Vaughn Monroe and Gene Autry. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After they took Mike Daguerre's body to the morgue, the local constables held me all that night in custody. Several Cheyenne hotel employees, finding nothing better to do for excitement, finally showed up to certify that Daguerre had come into the hotel already shot up. So I was clean, and they let me leave a little after dawn. When I got back to my room, Paul McGraw's contingent of operatives had already arrived. There was Ralph Haycraft from Continental, Carl Royal, Chip Hannigan, who handled the St. Louis Diamond Heist, Patty Phillips from Detroit, Rocky Andresano, reliable Jerry Cotte, Tip Miller, Rod Cornell, and a guy who saved my life once in Denver. K.G. Peterson. Johnny, how are you? Hi, fine. Hey, how's everybody, huh? Chip, Patty, Ralph, good to see you. Uh, Chesapeake's certainly spreading the dough around. What's the scoop, Johnny? This is a big one. It's going to take all of us. Now, if you'll sit down, I'll, I'll go over it for you. All right, here's the story. Chesapeake insured a high school building here about six months ago. Yesterday, it fell on its face. One, it was not built to specifications. Or two, somebody blew it down. Or both. In any case, we don't pay off. But... We have to prove our case. Now, there are too many leads for one man to follow before they evaporate. The guy who signed the building inspection papers was killed last night, a guy named Mike Daguerre. Carl and Chip, that's your job. Find out everything about him, his bank account, his friends, his troubles, his wife, everything. Oh, his wife, yeah, she's living at 113 South Street. Uh, you'd find a girl on Mount Everest, Johnny. <laughs> well, she's not my type, honestly. Rob and Tip, your man is the building contractor, Big Jim Madden. He's cocky, belligerent, but I think you guys can handle him. Run him down. Bank accounts, purchase orders, what kind of money he spends, so on. Patty and Ralph, find out everything about Stankovich, the janitor who was found in the ruins. Rocky and Jerry, start talking with anybody in town who might know anything. Bars, restaurants, street corners, teachers, pupils, anybody, anywhere. And report back to me anytime you want. Now, don't push anybody around, but don't let anybody push you guys around. Anyone have anything to say? Yeah, just one thing. Let's get this thing over so I can get back to Philadelphia. I'm about to become a father. <laughs> I thought I'd sit back a while and see what kind of birds were flushed up from the dusty meadows of Manhattan, Nebraska. An hour later, my first bird winged in. But it wasn't at all what I expected. It was a tall, gray-haired man, his honor, Mayor Randall. Hey, Mr. Dollar, I've seen the men you brought into town today, and I wanted to talk with you about them. Fine. What about in particular? Yeah, the events of the past 24 hours in this town have been deplorable and grossly injurious to the public welfare. The collapse of our beautiful schoolhouse, 
the death of our beloved janitor Stankovich, and the untimely murder of one of our respected public servants, Mr. DeGarra. All have grieved me deeply. None of which were caused by any of my investigators, Mr. Mayor. Oh, my purpose here is not a belligerent one, Mr. Dollar. On the contrary, I came seeking assistance. We are a small community with a rudimentary police force, not equipped for major criminal investigations. I want these matters brought to a head and cleared up. And I came to offer a complete cooperation between you and our municipal government. I never turn down cooperation, Mayor, and I'll accept yours. You can begin by telling me everything you know about the schoolhouse. Oh, certainly. It was commissioned two years ago, uh, designed by William Garrett, built by James Madden six months ago. The uh, unfortunate Mr. DeGuerra inspected it and called it up to snuff. And on the basis of his official inspection, your company insured it. I had no idea until yesterday that it was an unsafe building. Was DeGuerra reliable? Oh, I know nothing about his personal life, Mr. Dollar, but in his job, he was competent and above reproach. He couldn't have been competent if he approved an unsafe building. Yes, I wondered about that myself, but I'm not prepared at the moment with an answer. Where are the purchase orders for the materials used in that building? The purchase orders? Yeah. Purchase orders. I can't seem to recall uh, where they were undoubtedly destroyed, along with other useless paper matters that were accumulated from the construction work. Uh... Material purchase orders are never useless when the building falls down afterwards. If you find them... I'd like to be invited in. Well, I will certainly look for them, Mr. Dollar. I want to cooperate with you in every way. I'm sure you do. And you'll hear from me when I need something. Thank you, Mayor. And good day. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, the city council will, of course, have to file an immediate claim with your company. We take the bitter with the sweet. I pondered his statement for a while and got nowhere. There are mayors and mayors, and this one was of the old school, full of cliches and overblown rhetoric and nothing else. In a little while, calls began coming in from the men. Chip reported that during the building construction, Mike DeGuerra had made four deposits of $5,000 each in the bank. His salary was $7,500 a year. I thought another talk with Mrs. DeGuerra was in order and made for her house. She answered the door with tears in her eyes, a black lace handkerchief, and a black dress. It was tight, satin, and low-cut. Not exactly Emily Post for morning, but... It was black. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad you came. I'm so unhappy and lost. Yeah, I can see. May I come in? Why not? Is there anything special you want, Mr. Dollar? I'm sorry to cut in on your hour of bereavement, Mrs. DeGuerra, but under the circumstances, I... Know. I... I'm not sure I can help you any. I'm so broken up. If you're not careful, you might drown in those tears. You cheap gumshoe. You dropped your act. Well, don't bother to pick it up in that dance hall dress and shoes. Is that what you thought was expected of you? Look, this setup creaks from top to bottom. Come on now, your late husband made seventy-five hundred a year and deposited twenty thousand in six months. Is that figure? I don't know anything about his money. All I know is the bank told me he only had three hundred left. What did he do with it? What do you think? He spent it on other women. Then why the tragic act? Not very good at it, am I? Not the best. And I really loved him. He loved me. We kicked it away because we both wanted more excitement than this town or his salary could give us. There was no place to go. We just didn't get along. He, he was out spending his money on other women, being a big shot. I can't blame him, though. I, I helped make him do it. What about the money? He got it for falsifying the school inspection papers, didn't he? Well, he didn't get it, inventing the telephone. Who gave it to him? I don't know. Well, who do you think killed him, and why? I don't know that either. Well, what do you know? Look, he didn't leave any insurance, see, and I got to live the best way I can. If I stay in this town, I got to keep friends. If I don't want to keep them, I got no choice but to move, and that takes money. I wonder what could possibly be on your mind. The company you represent handles insurance, doesn't 263 it? 263 different kinds. Are you particular what kind of premiums you collect? We pay off on a lot of things. Just what kind of insurance were you thinking about, madam? $2,000 in down. Got your pen? No, but my word's good at the cashier's cage. What do you got? I'm trusting you. Mike got that $20,000 from the Universal Rock Company for, quote, services rendered, unquote. You know who owns the rock company? Big Jim Madden? Close enough, Big Jim's brother. Last night, when Mike showed up in town, he was gunning for trouble. Why? He said they were going to make a patsy out of him, and he wasn't going to take the rap for anybody, that's what he said. 
I think he ran out of money and came back to make a touch in exchange for disappearing again. And Madden shot him. I didn't say that because I don't know. Now do I get my insurance? Yeah. If what you say is true, I'll have to check first. I finally tore myself away from the grieving widow and headed back to the hotel in case any of the boys called. On my way down Main Street, getting the worst end of the local stairs, someone with a wrinkled coat and bourbon on his breath stepped out of a doorway and stopped me. Bill Garrett, the architect. Dollar? Yeah, Garrett, what is it? I finally got up courage enough to do something decent. Decent for me, anyway. For anybody else, it would be too low to talk about. What was it? Well, I'm not much of a lawyer. But they say there's a statute in the books that says a private citizen may commit a crime to prevent a greater crime from being committed and still go free. Is that right? Most states have it. I suppose Nebraska does, too. Well, I committed a crime. I'm a Fagan, that's what I am. So long, Garrett. I'm busy. Oh, now, Johnny, wait wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, now, just written on the head of a pin, it goes this way. I had a secretary in the mayor's office steal something from his private file. Here. The purchase orders for our humble contribution to ageless architecture, the Little Red Schoolhouse, signed by no other spotless member of our model community than James G. Madden. I looked at them and they were as advertised. Purchase orders complete down to the last tenpenny nail. Not being a technical expert, I decided to shoot him back to Paul McGraw for his perusal. I sent them from the local post office, insured, registered airmail, and special delivery. Then I walked up the steps of the city hall for a chat with his honor. Good afternoon, Dollar. My door is open to you any time. Glad you feel that way, and I hope you still do when I finish. You finish what, Dollar? Calling you a liar. No, see, here. Save the B-picture dialogue for your next campaign. I thought you told me the purchase orders on the schoolhouse were destroyed. Well, to my knowledge, they were. Look in your personal file. Folder Mark Madden, personal, hold. I, I don't know what you mean. Go on, look. No. No, don't bother. Because all you'll find is an empty space. <laughs> you ought to see your face, Mayor. I... Well, Mayor, they were in there, but somebody stole them and gave them to me. Yeah. I sent them to my company for examination. And I'm sure somebody's going to be in a jackpot. When the material purchase doesn't come up to the specifications of the building. I, Dollar, this is outrageous. Indeed it is. And it was outrageous from the day your city started to build that school. Well, all right. I'll tell you why I did what I did. For money. Keep your filthy insinuations to yourself. Insinuation? Your Honor, that was a plain statement. I wanted to spare this city the loss of faith it would suffer, seeing one of its most prominent citizens exposed and driven out. A man is entitled to one mistake in his life, and Jim Madden is no exception. I plan to bring him to a private accounting and make him replace the money he made on that building and repair it to specifications. Only the tragedy occurred before I took matters in hand. You had six months to do it. And every day of that six months, 1,800 students might have been killed. And one man was killed. No one knows that better than I. But once having decided on this course of action, I, I didn't know how to go about rectifying things. My intentions were good, but they went astray in the interests of... Humanity and brotherhood. Mayor Randall, you are as full of wind as a Chicago street. You are not only windy, you're corny, stupid, careless, and you're criminal. On the strength of what you told me here, my company will never pay that claim. Dollar, I was trapped. Look, I'm going to pick up Madden right now, and Randall, I suggest that you give yourself up to your own police chief before I have him do it for me. <laughs> I raced back to my hotel to organize my men and pick up Madden. When I came in, the phone was ringing. It was Rocky Andresano saying he had two witnesses to Daguerre's shooting. I told him to pick up the boys and come right over. I hung up just as the door opened and three sullen characters with brick dust on their shoulders came in, uninvited. Want to come with us, Dollar? What do you need? Fourth at bridge? Come on. No, thanks. Uh, guys, that'll do it. <laughs> Strictly no contest, and with one on each side working a punishing arm lock, I casually strolled out of the room and down the elevator to the street. We were coming out of the hotel when I saw Rocky, Chip, K.G. Ralph crossing the street. My boys did real well, especially K.G. Peterson, who was in a hurry to get back to his wife. After we subdued the hoods, 
I said a few words to their leader. Don't ask me nothing. Sorry, this is quiz night. Madden sent you, didn't he? Never heard of him. You wouldn't do that by yourself. We're not proving that. Talk. Lay off. Lay off. Of course he sent us. Who else? Where were you supposed to take me and why? Why, I don't know. Where? The Universal Rock Company on the edge of town. It was a huge, dusty building next to some intricate rock-crushing machinery. Parked in front of it were three cars. A yellow convertible, such as a well-to-do contractor might drive, a long black sedan, such as a city official might have, and a small sedan, such as anybody might have. We covered all the exits, and K.G. Peterson and I went up the front way. We were halfway up to the offices when... We pounded up to the landing just as Big Jim Madden staggered out of an open office and fell twisting on the stairs. Through the open door, I saw a flash of black skirt and a hand holding a gun that started jumping. Give me that. It's empty. Dollar. It's all right, Mayor. I'll get an ambulance out here as soon as I can. We took Vivian Daguerre into custody. Randall was in bad shape, and he died two hours later. But before he died, he told me the whole story. It, it was my idea from beginning to end. Madden didn't want to do it, but I told him if he didn't, he'd never get another contract from this city. We were able to split $100,000 with the cheap supplies we used in that building. Well, when I showed up, Madden, he was afraid he was going to take the rap alone, huh? He was afraid he'd end up like Mike Daguerre. Is that right? Yes, I had to have Daguerre killed. He wanted more money. And you kept the purchase orders so you could make Madden do what you wanted him to do. When he found out that your company had them, he, he was going to turn both of us in. I talked him out of it. Yeah, with a gun. He's dead. He's better that way. Why is it there's always a falling out among thieves? That was the last question Mayor Randall ever asked on Earth. And like other men before him who had lived with deceit and treachery, Randall didn't live long enough to get an answer. It turned out he had an ex-wife in Detroit and a daughter living in Miami, but neither one of them claimed his body. His estate was tied up by the city, and the county buried him in Potter's Field, right next to another thief named Jim Madden. No one wrote anything on their headstones. No one cared. The reform city government was too busy floating a bond issue for a new high school. Bill Garrett's going to design it, and this time, I'm pretty sure they'll follow his plans. Expense account total, $3,227. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in Harry M. Popkins' United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Victor Perrin, Elliot Reed, High Aberback, Clayton Post, Bill Conrad, Virginia Gregg, and Willer Waterman. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us next week when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien will appear in another transcribed adventure of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You can bet your life it's fun. It's a laugh a minute. You can bet your life it's full of surprises. It's radio's craziest quiz show, and you bet your life it'll be one of your favorites when you join Groucho Marx every Wednesday over most of these same CBS stations for You Bet Your Life. Now stay tuned for The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>